Welcome back everyone, what's the science behind that is my name and what's the history behind that is my game. Briefly here, viewer discretion is advised, say everyone is indeed entitled to own opinions regarding certain subjects and all that I'm asking is you respect my opinion regarding certain subjects. Alright, so in today's video, I will be walking you through the Abrahamic dynasty. This video will be focusing mainly on the family of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I will also be mentioning a secret biblical connection to the Egyptians. This dynasty will take place between Egypt's 11th and 18th dynasties. Now before I start today's video, I just want to give a really big shout out to Matthew as he is the one who created this chart for me. He has also given me full permission to use the images for today's video. And I also want to say that even though that today's video is not sponsored by Fever in any way, I also would like you guys to go ahead and check it out as this is where Matthew has his genealogy site located on. If you're interested in making a minimalistic chart just like this one, then you should definitely send him a message and he will be more than happy to make you a chart. And as always, if I can find the link, I will put it in the description box below. Okay, let's start with Terra. He was the king of Argade. He lived from 2128 BC to 1923 BC. He was born in Ur Kasdim Chaldea Sumer, which is in present day southern Iraq, and died in Charan, Padam, Aram, Turkey, and his place of burial was in Haran. He was, like most people back then, married to multiple women, nine women in fact, but I will only talk about three of them. Pelila, Amathalo, and Toei bin Senuset. Terra has several siblings, two of which are listed in the Quran, Azar and Karaset, although some scholars have argued about the identity of Azar. Terra is basically a biblical figure in the book of Genesis. He is listed as the son of Nahor and the father of the patriarch Abraham, and as such, he is listed as the descendant of Shem's son Arphaxad. Terra is mentioned in Genesis 11.26, through 27, Joshua 24, 2, and 1 Chronicles 1, 17 through 27 of the Hebrew Bible, and is also mentioned in Luke 3, 34 through 36 in the New Testament. According to rabbinical tradition, Terah was a wicked, adulterous, either priest or king, who manufactured idols. Abraham, in opposition to his father's idol shop, smashed his father's idols and even chased people away. The Zohar, for example, says that when God saved Abram from the furnace, Ter repented. This is mentioned in Zohar Genesis 177b. And Rabbi Abba Bikahana said that God assured Abram that his father Terah would also have a portion in the world to come. This was mentioned in Genesis Rabbah 34 and 3012. Terah is identified as the person who arranged and led the family to embark on a mysterious journey to Canaan. It is shrouded in mystery to Jewish scholars as to why Terah began the journey and as to why the journey ended prematurely. It has been suggested that he was a man in search of a greater truth that could possibly be found in the familiar land of Canaan and that it was Abram who picked up the torch and continued his father's quest, the same quest that Terah himself was unable to achieve. In Islam, for example, Abraham's father is believed to have been a disbelieving man due to his refusal to listen to the constant advice of his son. In fact, the earliest story involving Abraham is in the Quran in his discussion with his Ab, which is Arabic for uncle. The name given for this man in Quran 674 is Azar. As an uncle, Azar required his nephew's most sincere advice. Abraham, after receiving his first revelations from God, invited his fathers to the way of Islam. Abraham explained to him the false of idolatry and why he was wrong to worship objects which could neither hear nor see. Abraham told his father that he had indeed received revelations from God, knowledge which his father did not possess, and told him that belief in God would grant him immense rewards in both this life and the hereafter. Abraham concluded his preaching by warning his father of the great punishment he would later face if he did not mend his ways. When Abraham offered his father the guidance and advice of God, he rejected it and later threatened to stone Abraham to death. Abraham then prayed for his father to be given by God, and although he continued to seek forgiveness, it was only because of a promise that he made to him earlier. 
When it became clear that Terra's unrelenting hatred towards monotheism would never be fought, Abraham disassociated himself from him. Okay, now back to basics. Terra and Amethelo had three sons, Haran, Nahor II, and the patriarch Abraham, whom I believe lived from 1972 BC to 1797 BC. When Terra married Palila, they had a son called Tezova, and when Terra married Toit ben Senusret, sometimes known as Toit of Elephantine, or sometimes known as Amphitatin in Egypt, they had a daughter, the matriarch Sarah, and the one whom was married to Abraham. Toit, being of Egyptian origins, was in fact the great-granddaughter of the pharaoh Mentehotep II. Toweit, or Enfetatinen, was also married to the pharaoh Amenemhat I, whom ruled from 1991 BC to 1962 BC. He was the first ruler of the 12th dynasty of the Middle Kingdom of Egypt. Her relationships were recorded on a statuette of her son, Pharaoh Senusret I, and she held the title of the king's mother. Now, what I find interesting is that Amenemhat I was probably the same as the vizier named Amenemhat who led an expedition to Wadi Hamemet under his predecessor Menhotep IV, and possibly overthrew him from power. Scholars differ as to whether Menhotep IV was killed by Amenemhat I, yet there is no independent evidence to suggest this, and there may have even been a period of co regency between their reigns. Toweit, as we all know, according to the Bible, had a daughter named Sarah with her husband Terah, making Sarah not only Abraham's half-sister, but also the matriarch, as she later married Abraham. Now you might be wondering how on earth I was able to make a connection between the Israelites and the Egyptians. Well, it all started when I watched a YouTube video by the YouTube channel called Spirit Science, where they have a video called The Hidden Human History Movie, and in that video the creator flat out states that Jesus was of Egyptian origins. He also makes numerous other preposterous claims, but it did make me wonder, what does the Bible actually say? Well, the genealogy mentioned in the Bible doesn't really give us much details, but their wives, on the other hand, do. And if you look at the wives of the biblical characters, oftentimes, some of them were either the daughters of Egyptian pharaohs, some of them were married to Egyptian pharaohs, and some of them even had children who eventually became pharaohs of Egypt. Take Abraham's other wife, Hagar, for example. She was a runaway Egyptian princess slave that Sarah gave to Abraham, and Hagar's father was the pharaoh Salatis, the first Hyksos king, and her brother was the pharaoh Sakrahar. And since we all know that her son was Ishmael, wouldn't this by blood make Ishmael an Egyptian, or at least of Egyptian heritage instead of a Jewish one? Furthermore, we can say the same for Mahalath I, a wife of Ishmael and the daughter of Pharaoh Sunusret I, who reigned from 1971 BC to 1926 BC, and the mother of Mahalath II, a wife of Azu and the twin brother to the patriarch Jacob, whom lived from 1677 BC to 1530 BC. I'll go into further details about this momentarily. The story of the three patriarchs is a rather interesting story. The patriarch Abraham, Abraham in Hebrew, and Ibrahim in Islam, and originally called Abram, is understood to be the first of the three Hebrew patriarchs and a figure revered by the three greatest monotheistic religions, Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. According to the book of Genesis, Abraham left the city of Ur, i.e. Mesopotamia, because God called him to found a new nation in an undesignated land that he later learns was Canaan. He obeyed the commands of the guard for whom he received promises and a covenant that his seed would inherit the land. Abraham married his half-sister Sarah and began a long journey from Mesopotamia to Haran and then later from Canaan to Egypt. Detailed in the book of Genesis chapters 12 through 25, his journey is depicted in the Bible as a long and a dramatic one a journey where Abraham and Sarah encounters many different cultures, customs, and even people groups along the Fertile Crescent from Mesopotamia all the way over to Egypt. Upon entering Egypt, for example, Abraham instructed Sarah to pretend to be his sister as he was afraid that the Pharaoh would then kill him. Now this could possibly be a reference to Pharaoh Senusret II. 
Now let's take a step away from Christianity for a moment and view things from the Islamic point of view. The Dome of the Rock is an Islamic shrine located on the Temple Mount in the Old City of Jerusalem. It was initially completed in 961 AD at the orders of Umayyad Caliph Abd al-Malik during the Second Fina on the site of the Second Jewish Temple in 70 AD. The original Dome of the Rock collapsed in 1015 and was later rebuilt in 1022. This dome, in its core, is one of the oldest extant works of Islamic architecture. The foundation stone inside the temple was built over what is believed to have been the very same place where Abraham attempted to sacrifice his son Isaac, or in Islam, Ishmael. As a matter of fact, there is a 1500-year-old Egyptian papyrus that even retells this very same sacrifice. In the Bible, for example, it clearly tells us that the sacrifice took place on Mount Moriah, identified as the Temple Mount. Now, historically speaking, historians date the story of Abraham roughly right around 2000 BC. Based on clues given in the book of Genesis, such as Genesis 11.31, for example, it clearly states that Abraham's father, Terah, took his son, meaning Abraham, and his family out of a city called Ur. Now, according to the biblical viewpoint, or in other words, an illustrated atlas, the Ur of the Chaldeans didn't exist until nearly 1500 years after Abraham. So what gives? Historians have concluded that the Jewish scribes from the 6th century BC assumed the name was tied to the same place and period that they knew in their time. However, archaeologists have also uncovered new evidence over the past several decades that may shed some new light on the area of the city in which corresponds more closely to the time of Abraham. Now, amongst these artifacts found, some 20,000 clay tablets were found deep inside the ruins of the ancient city of Marai, also known as modern Syria. Marai is said to have been located on the Euphrates River some 30 miles north of the border between Syria and Iraq. In its time, Marai was the key center on the trade routes between Babylon, Egypt, and Persia, or otherwise known as modern Iran. Marai was said to be the capital of King Zimri Lim in the 18th century BC. This was until it was conquered and destroyed by King Hammurabi in the late 20th century AD. French archaeologists looking for Marai dug through centuries of sand to uncover Zimri Lim's former palace. Now deep within the ruins they had found clay tablets written in ancient cuneiform. Now if these clay tablets are indeed correct, then the Sumerian city of Ur is the most likely place Abraham's family departed rather than the Ur of Chaldeans. Now what I find really interesting about these clay tablets is that they offer additional information about the political and cultural strife around the time and even offers clues to Abraham's migration. Because of this information, scholars have concluded that Abraham's tribe may have been Amorites. Now as a result of these findings, archaeologists now believe that those who wanted to escape only had one direction to go to for safety, north. Let's put it this way, going south would lead you to the Persian Gulf, and nothing but open desert would lay to the west. In the east, however, refugees from Ur would have encountered Elamites, another tribal group from Persia, whose influx also hastened Ur's downfall. The logical route would have been to travel north. Here is a little known fun fact for everyone. Did you know that the earliest reference to Abraham is listed in a victory inscription of Pharaoh Shashank? The campaign occurred around 925 BC during the reign of Rehoboam. Now this is clearly a reference to Fort Abram. This is mentioned in 1 Kings 14.25-26 through 26, and as well as in 2 Chronicles 12.2-12. 12 12. Now as you can see, this section of the chart is very interesting for a couple of reasons. One being is how the matriarchs Rebecca and Leah are connected to the family tree, and the other one being Lot the nephew of Abraham, and the same nephew that was saved moments before the destruction of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, most of you may not actually know this, but Abraham's rescue of Lot actually started over grazing lands. Lot and Abraham both had flocks and herds, but when they came to an area that could not sustain both men's bounty, argument broke up between the herdsmen working for them. Now, trying to avoid further conflict, Lot actually left and headed east to the fertile plains of Siddim, establishing his tent before Sodom. Meanwhile, Abraham stayed in Canaan and moved to the plains of Memre, which is in Hebron, or otherwise known as modern-day Palestine.
Now, after many years had passed, on one fateful day, a group of refugees brought news to Abraham that the armies of Mesopotamia had marched on Sodom. A great battle had taken place, and they informed him that his nephew Lot had been captured. Now, before we get to Abraham's reaction, we must pause to ponder a few facts. According to the story, four leaders made war on the five kings of the plains. But who are these rulers, and what caused the armies of Mesopotamia to join forces in order to occupy the cities of the Jordan River Plain? What was their objective, and how exactly could a vast army come together, form a collection of nations, and sojourn into the region? Unfortunately for our inquiring minds, the Bible is fairly silent with regard to the Mesopotamian invasion of the Jordanian land. However, this should not stop us from trying to solve the riddle. What can be gathered, or given the timing of events, is that the mega power of the region was none other than the Mesopotamian Empire of Ur III, or otherwise known as the Third Dynasty of Mesopotamia. Fun fact, the Third Dynasty of Ur is commonly abbreviated as Ur III by historians studying the period. It is numbered in reference to previous dynasties, such as the First Dynasty of Ur, which took place from the 26th to the 25th century BC, However, it seems that the once supposed second dynasty of Ur was never recorded. The third dynasty of Ur was the last Sumerian dynasty which came to preeminent power in Mesopotamia. It began after several centuries of control by Akkadian and Gushan kings. It controlled the cities of Ishin, Larsa, and Ashuna and extended as far north as Upper Mesopotamia. The king that is most likely responsible for mobilizing and executing the operation, therefore, would have been Amurfael of Shinar, meaning summer, otherwise known as King Amarasin of Ur, whom ruled Ur for nine years from 1834 to 1826 BC. When it comes to controlling his empire, King Amarasin of Ur did things a tad bit differently, yet with impressive results. Instead of acting like the Akkadian rulers, who stationed military troops throughout the imperial state, Adam Mersin decided it would be best to use peaceful and constructive socio-economic incentives to extend the revamped Sumerian city-states on the outer edges. It's not that surprising, then, that during this period, Ur achieved the highest economic production of the region, allowing the construction of major public buildings. Furthermore, in place of military enforcement, Adam Mersin established NC, or governors, if you will, who enjoyed almost complete independence. These NCs, if you will, for the most part, were natives of the area they controlled, a policy that not only encouraged local cultural development, but also cemented the imperial structure by doing so. So what did Adamerson then do with all of these newly acquired riches and glory? Well, maybe predictably as both a man and a man of his time, he expanded the state through war. While the exact boundaries of Ur's expansion during his nine-year reign are a tad bit hazy, yet we do know that he conducted war in the northeasterly districts. Additionally, Adamson increased the sphere of influence with a policy of matrimonial alliances, as was the case with city-states of Mari and Alam. These alliances allowed Adamson to utilize their army for economic expansion by force. Eventually, Adamson's power lost favor within his realm. Twelve years had passed, and the city-states of Sodom, Gomorrah, Adama, Zebrahim, and Zoar were then tired of paying tribute to the king. Adamersen, no doubt, angered over the news, mobilized his forces. All they knew that war was inevitable. Around spring on the 14th year, the armies of Ur set out. The number of troops partaking in this military operation were around 10,000 men, perhaps a bit less. The route they probably took to reach their targets would have been the King's Highway, along the heights of Transjordan, through the land of Moab, and descended via the deep gorge of the River Karak, and into the southeast shore of the Salt Sea, and into the Great Valley of Araba. The first city to go was Bela, later called Zoar, where the armies of Ur tore down the walls, burnt the city, and even confiscated all of the valuables that they could find. News of the disaster traveled quickly to the other city-states, causing the northern Araba citizens and rulers to panic and fear the worst. This is exactly what the invaders wanted, psychological warfare to help bend the knees of their enemies. Many of the northern Araba citizens fled westward around the shore of the Salt Sea to the Valar Plain of Siddam. In particular, many sought refuge behind the mighty walls of Sodom, hoping that the armies of Mesopotamia would eventually turn back and head home after they received their fill. Yet, they were disappointed. The Mesopotamian armies continued to tour the region, making hits in the dry land of Negev, 
and this is before pushing north towards the rebel kings who were hiding up in the strongholds. The five kings of the plain knew that by staying behind their walls, they would secure nothing but their own demise, being picked off one by one. Marching out together as a unified force to meet the enemy on the field of battle, they finally concluded this would be their only chance of countering the enemy. Both armies lined up for battle on the west shore of the Salt Sea, just south of Sodom. Even though the battles was not recorded in any details, it was no doubt prolonged, bloody, and downright messy. The kings of the plain were defeated. King Bada of Sodom and King Barasha of Gautam were later killed. Their bodies were cast into the bitumen pits of the Salt Sea Basin. King Adama, Zebroam, and Bela survived and fled to the hills. It wasn't just these kings who escaped into the hills either, but also everyone else seeking safety from the armies of Mesopotamia who were later marauding the landscape. They were destroying property, taking values, and even enslaving people. It was around this time that Abraham got the word of the events. One of his kinfolk reported what had happened and Lot had been taken captive. If he didn't do something soon, he concluded that Lot would eventually be sold into slavery. And now we return to the beginning of our story. How exactly did Abraham react to this news? Well, he didn't hesitate. First, he sent messengers to the Confederate Amorite alleys, informing them of the situation and asking for assistance. Once the messengers were on their way, Abraham updated the menfolk in his household. He told them that he would go after and rescue Lot. He continued that if any man was willing to help him, he should step forward now. Now exactly how many men were in Abraham's camp is unclear. However, we do know that 318 men in his household voluntarily came forward. These men were most likely already trained in the martial arts and were quickly armed according to the specialty. Abraham and his men traveled north for many days, likely taking the king's highway, gathering intelligence, and keeping an eye on the enemy's movements. Finally, they found them. The armies of Mesopotamia were encamped near the town of Laish, meaning the town of Dan, celebrating their victories. Abraham kept a watchful eye on the festivities, likely keeping track of the guards and their movements. Perhaps he was even collecting information on the exact location of both the prisoners and the loot from the people whom were not aligned with the armies coming in and out of the encampment. Abraham waited for many hours, allowing the alcohol drunk by the enemies to take full effect. Now once the army succumbed to intoxication, Abraham divided his men into two groups of 159. The enemy had fallen into a drunken sleep, their fires flickering, casting long and dark shadows. It was in this setting that Abraham and his men infiltrated the camp in silence and smoked many dreaming foes. Now once Lot and the loot was found, Abraham and his men quickly packed up and moved out before any alarm could be made. Abraham was clearly successful in what was technically the first recorded special operations mission ever, and this is one that is still studied today in many military academies. The story of Sodom and Gomorrah is an interesting one. Now, because of the wickedness of these very cities, God had destroyed them, and as Lot exited the city of Sodom, his wife turned around and transformed into a pillar of salt. We also know that afterwards, Abraham, along with his men, camped at the Valley of Sheva, and the new king of Sodom, who among others was still hiding, also came out. He received the news that Abraham had indeed defeated the Mesopotamian army, and also retrieved the property of the people and that of the five kings. But before the kings of the plain arrived, Melchizedek, whom is a priest king of Salem, meaning Jerusalem, also visited Abraham. Melchizedek, who had no part of the war, recognized kindness when he saw it. He came out to Abraham and his men, bringing food and drink. He thanked Abraham and blessed him for his good deeds. Abraham, seeing the sincerity of Melchizedek, responded to the priest king by giving a tithe, while Melchizedek responded with hospitality, wanting nothing more but to say thank you and the king of Sodom was rather political in his approach. He didn't say thank you, nor did he offer food or drink. Instead, the king of Sodom actually tried to strike a deal with Abraham. He offered Abraham all of the loot, just as long as he returned the people back to the king. Now, the problem with this is that the Mesopotamian kings had captured the people and looted the cities of the plains. Abraham had in fact not taken anything from them, Furthermore, he owed the kings of the plains nothing legally or morally. Anything taken was technically legal by the fair fortunes of war. 
But Abraham was not like that. Instead of making a deal with the king and his royal entourage, Abraham actually refused to keep the loot or the people, even though he was clearly entitled to it. In other words, Abraham would only accept riches from God, not from some politicians seeking out to strike a deal. For him, rescuing his nephew Lot was rewarding enough. Now the biblical account of Sodom and Gomorrah's heavenly destruction is considered to be legendary. These two cities are universally understood to represent sin, sexual license, immorality, horror, and destruction. The biblical account is far from being a fable, as scientists have now discovered evidence of an actual catastrophic event unmistakably akin to the one described in the book of Genesis. New archaeological evidence suggests that these two cities were indeed destroyed by fire, which would cohere with the biblical time frame of Sodom and Gomorrah's destruction. There have been brimstone and sulfur found within these two cities, which are located near the southern part of the Dead Sea. In 1975, archaeologists excavating an ancient royal palace in Ebla, Syria, have actually uncovered roughly 2,000 inscribed tablets. Now, of these 2,000 tablets which were discovered, only 1,860 tablets only mention the same five biblical cities in identical order given to those mentioned in the book of Genesis. Furthermore, the kings named as ruling the cities also match to that of the Bible. At these cities, you can find the remains of collapsed houses covered in ash, an ash-covered sphinx-like structure, the remains of a city gate, and even a partial ziggurat which are covered in sulfur. The ground is literally covered in balls of sulfur. Studies suggest that these cities may have been struck by an exploding meteorite which covered the Dead Sea area with a superheated brine of Dead Sea and hydride salts. This event may have actually been similar to that of the Tunguska incident in 1908. In fact, on Mount Sodom, Israel researchers have discovered the world's longest salt cave, a network of twisting passageways. This labyrinthine cavern stretches more than 10 kilometers in length. Here's my conclusion. The evidence of the Middle Bronze Age volcanism is indeed present in both the Dead Sea and in the Jordan River regions. The two settlements, as you know it, Sodom and Gomorrah, show many animal bones covered in basaltic lava. Therefore, I can safely conclude that the exploding meteorite did in fact trigger the salt caverns, causing earthquakes, and thus erupting the nearby volcano in the region. Here's a fun fact about the salt caverns on Mount Sodom. You will actually find a giant humanoid looking pillar of salt, and according to researchers, this pillar of salt may very well be Lot's wife. Now just really briefly here, before I go too far ahead of myself, as you can see on this chart here, the matriarch Leah was actually the niece of the matriarch Rebecca. Leah's parents were Adina and Laban the Aramean. Now interestingly enough, Laban was actually the brother of the matriarch Rebecca. Now, another really interesting thing to note is that Adina's brother was Bethuel, both the father of Laban and the husband of Nahariam. Now, as you may already know, Nahariam was one of Lot's three siblings. Leah, interestingly enough, also had a sister, the matriarch Rachel, both of whom were married to the patriarch Jacob. Now, one thing that I would like to mention before we move on is yet another cave. A cave known as the Cave of Patriarchs. The Cave of Patriarchs is otherwise known as the Cave of Machpelah. The Cave of Machpelah is basically a series of caves located in the heart of the old city of Hebron. According to tradition, the cave and jointing field was purchased by Abraham as a burial plot. Over the years, the cave stands as a large rectangular enclosure dating back to the Herodian era. Shortly after, Muslim conquest had actually converted it into a mosque. By the late 12th century, Crusaders took over the site, but quickly taken back by Saladin in 1188, and later reconverted back into a mosque. In 1967, Israel took over the site, dividing it into both a synagogue and a mosque. Now, today, this site is considered to be the second most holiest place in the world. According to legend, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all of their wives are said to be buried inside this cave. In 1119 AD, a monk named Arnold actually found this cave, or rather essentially rediscovered it, and found their remains. In 1967, a little girl was sent inside the narrow cave to help study the artifacts, and in 1981, 
they rediscovered the square stone that goes to the chamber entrance and found pottery and as well as a wine jug. Okay, so now going back to the genealogy here. As you can see, Abraham was also married to multiple women. He married Sarah, whom bore Isaac, then Hagar, whom bore Ishmael, then Keturah, whom bore five children, Ishbek, Yuxin, Midian, Shua, and Zimram, and finally he married Hezwan bint Amen, whom also bore five children, Kaisan, Luthan, Naifiz, Sarhaj, and Umiam. Let's take Midian for example. Not only is he responsible for the Midianites, but his fourth great-granddaughter was Zipporah, the wife of Moses. I'll explain more on this momentarily, but for now, let's just talk about Ishmael. Ishmael had three children, Nebuchadnezzar, Keter, and Mahal II. One of the most popular ideas is that the Prophet Muhammad was a direct descendant of him through his son Keter. The oldest extant biography of Muhammad was compiled by Ibn Ishaq and edited by Ibn Hisham. However, it was well known among the Arabs that the Keterites were in fact the descendants of Ishmael. According to Muslim tradition, Ishmael thereby founded a great nation as promised by God in the Old Testament. He was later buried with his mother Hagar next to the Kaaba in Mecca under the area demarcated by the semicircular Hezer Ishmael wall. The Keterites, for example, were a northern Arab tribe that controlled the area between the Persian Gulf and the Sinai Peninsula. In the Abrahamic religious traditions, the Ishmaelites were a tribal confederation of Iron Age Semitic speaking tribes of the ancient Near East, which inhabited a part of the Arab world. They are named after Ishmael, a prophet and patriarch in the narrative of the Quran and Book of Genesis, the first son of the prophet and patriarch Abraham and the matriarch Hagar. According to Genesis, Ishmael had one daughter and twelve sons also known as the Twelve Princes, mentioned in Genesis 17.20. In Islamic tradition, these gave rise to the Twelve Tribes of Ishmael, Arab tribes from which the early Muslims were descended from. Interestingly enough, some Abrahamic scholars describe the historic tribe of Nabataeans as the descendants of Nabayath, based on similarity of sounds, but others reject this connection. Another really interesting thing to know is that Assyrian and Babylonian inscriptions refer to the Ishmaelites as Sumu Ulu. This is a tribal confederation that would take control of the incense trade routes during the dominance of the Assyrian Empire to the north. Assyrian and Babylonian royal inscriptions, as well as North Arabian inscriptions from between the 9th to the 6th century BC, mention the king of Kedar, sometimes as Arab and sometimes as Ishmaelite. The names Nabat, Keter, Abdil, Duma, Massa, and Temen were all mentioned in the Assyrian royal inscriptions as Arabian tribes. Jesser was mentioned in Greek inscriptions in the 1st century BC. Assyrian and Babylonian inscriptions have referred to the Ishmaelites as Semu'elu, and Ernest Knopf had written that Yishmael is a typical West Semitic personal name found in texts from the 3rd millennium BC to pre-Islamic Arabic in the first half of the 1st millennium CE. He argues that the North Arabian Samuel will be rendered as Shemuel by Assyrians. It wouldn't have the same meaning as Yismael, and hence the Shemuelu tribes will be descended to an ancestor named Yismael, which is angelicized as Ishmael. The Ishmaelite confederacy did have differences. The Kedu tribe's political center was Duma, or in other words, Dumat al Jandal, which is also the cultic residence of the six deities of the king of Arabs just as John Travis Noble writes. Tema's pantheon was quite different from that of Duma, which seems to be the capital of the Ishmaelites, even though Tema appeared to be a son of Ishmael Genesis 25. Noble then writes that it is unlikely that all of the 12 tribes associated with the sons of Ishmael were even in the Ishmaelite confederacy simultaneously. And tribes joined in one instance may not be part of it in another instance and they sometimes may have fought each other despite association with the wider Ishmaelite confederacy. However, the term Ishmaelite, or rather Samu'ilu, disappears from documentary sources as the Assyrian Empire fell. However, the individual tribes and members kept going on, as there are references from the time that Cyrus the Great came to power of the king's living in tents, and that southern Palestine and the surrounding areas were inhabited considerably by Arabs, having been entrenched there as early as the 6th century BC. According to Knopf, 
this expansion caused the tribes to decrease contact, and this caused the Ishmaelite Confederacy to end. Another really interesting thing to know is that medieval Arab genealogists usually divide Arabs into three separate groups. The ancient Arabs, which were tribes that had vanished or been destroyed, such as Ad or Thamud, which is often mentioned in the Quran as examples of God's power to destroy those who did not believe and follow their prophets and messengers. The pure Arabs of southern Arabia, descending from Khaitan, son of Eber, some of the Ketanites are said to have migrated from the land of Yemen following the destruction of the Marib Dam. And the Arabized Arabs of the center and north Arabia, descending from Ishmael, the eldest son of Abraham, through his descendant Ednan, such as the ancient tribe of Hawazin, or the modern-day tribes of Adwaba and Anaza. Ishmaelism, in this more limited definition, holds that Ishmael was both an important religious figure, an eponymous ancestor to some of the Arabs of Western Arabia. Prominence is given in Arab genealogical accounts to the first two of Ishmael's twelve sons, Nabayath and Keter, whom are also prominently featured in the Genesis account. It is likely that they and their tribes lived in northwestern Arabia and were historically the most important of the twelve Ishmaelite tribes. Now let's hop over here and talk about the Egyptians for a moment. Amenemhat II was the third pharaoh of the 12th dynasty of ancient Egypt. Although he ruled for at least 35 years, his reign was rather obscure, and as well as his family relationships. An early attestation of Amenemhat may have come from the tomb of the namesake Nomark Amenemhat, which is buried at Beni Hasan. This Nomark, who lived under Senusret I, escorted the king's son, Emini, in an expedition to Nubia, and it is believed that this prince, Emini, was none other than Amenemhat II in his youth. The identity of Amenemhat's queen consort is unknown. Many royal women were buried within the pyramid complex, but their relationships with the king is still unclear. A queen named Kimenub must be dated to the later 13th dynasty, and three king's daughters named Ida, Idawayret, and Kenmet must be Amenemhat's daughters, although a definitive proof is still lacking. His successor was likely his son, Senusret II. Other children included Prince Amenemhatin and Princess Nofret II and Kenemet Nofretjid. You'll have to forgive me if I'm butchering that name, but to keep things simple, let's just call her Kenem for short. And she was likely the same person as Kenem I, and both of these women later became wives of the purported brother Senusret II. And furthermore, a woman named Senet, which is known from the three statues, might actually be the wife of Amenemhat II. Senusret II was the fourth pharaoh of the 12th dynasty of Egypt. His pyramid was constructed at El Lahun. Senusret II took a great deal of interest in the Fayum Oasis region, and began work on an extensive irrigation system from Bar Yusuf through to Lake Muris through the construction of a dike at El Lahun and the addition of a network of drainage canals. The purpose of his project was to increase the amount of cultivable land in that area. The importance of this project is emphasized by Senuset II's decision to move the royal necropolis from Desher to El Lahun where he built his pyramid. This location would remain the political capital of the 12th and 13th dynasties of Egypt. The king also established the first known workers quarter in the nearby town of Senusrethetep. In my other chart, which I will cover in a later video, the pharaoh Sebenekfru, who reigned from 1806 to 1802, was the daughter of the pharaoh Amenemhat III and a woman known as Ayat la Grande Igorath, or Nefrasovic de Thebes in Egypt. Igorath was the daughter of Azu and Mahalat II. Not much is known about her other than she was the last member of the royal family of the 12th dynasty. What is really interesting is that the first two kings of the new dynasty were the sons of Amenemhat IV, who, although was not born of royal birth, ruled between Amenemhat III and Nefrasovic. According to the Turing king list, Nefrasovic's successor was most likely to be Sobekhotep Sekemre Kudowai, 
In the Turing King list, we can see that Nefrasovic's successor had ruled over the Nile Valley, which stretched from Memphis all the way to Elephantine. A key factor that should be noted is that Mahalat I, the daughter of Senushret I and wife to Ishmael, joined the ranks of Neameth, Ora, Leoroska, Toed, and Sarah in the recombining of the royal lines Foles by marrying Ishmael. As you will see momentarily, Igareth was also married to Ahariam and bore a son named Potiphera, the priest of On. Potiphera married a woman called Zuleika. Now let's look at Tuya for example, which is spelt as T-U-Y-A, or Tuya, sometimes spelt as T-J-U-Y-A, is simply identified as a woman only known in the Bible as a Senath. Now the only thing that I know about her is what is found in the Bible. Her father is named as Shechem, but doesn't seem to list her mother. I figured it was probably Dina, as it states in the Old Testament that there was a sojourn, and that the two sons of Jacob, Simon and Levi, avenged their sister Dina. The story later tells us that she was raped by Shechem, found in Genesis 34. The only reason that I put Tuya as the daughter of Dina is because most traditions that trace her to the family Jacob relate that she was born the daughter of Dina, and that Dina left a senate on the wall of Egypt, where she was later found by Potiphar. Now to be honest, I'm not entirely sure if Tuya and Tahuya were the same person or separate individuals, and so this is why I had two separate individuals placed on the chart. Tahuya was said to be an Egyptian noblewoman, and as well as the mother of Queen Tai, the grandmother of Akhenaten, and the great-grandmother of Tutankhamun. Their daughter, Tai, became a great royal wife of Amenhotep III. What's really interesting are Amenhotep III's parents. They were the Pharaoh Thutmose IV and a mystery woman called Menemwaya. In the book, The Biographical Dictionary of Ancient Egypt, it tells us that Joseph was the brother of Queen Menemwaya. Other than that, we really don't know a whole lot about her. Now, going over to the patriarch Jacob, he is probably one of the more familiar characters in the Bible, as it is he who gave rise to the twelve tribes of Israel, or to be more specific, the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. Now, some of you guys may know that this is where British Israelism starts. However, I won't get into that in today's video. Perhaps I'll make a video on it sometime in the near future. Alright, we have finally come down to the last section of this chart, Moses and the Exodus. Now, just so that we're all caught up, the story of Exodus is actually based on the prophecy that was promised to Abraham. It was 430 from the time Abraham entered into Canaan to the time Moses received the law on Mount Sinai. That would be 215 years each. The prophecy itself was given after the five kings were defeated. The relationship of the Hebrews to the Egyptians is oftentimes overlooked. Abraham, as I mentioned earlier, went to Canaan and then to Egypt due to a famine in roughly the year 1921. In about 1917, Abraham later returned back to Canaan. Now the fact of the matter is that it was 215 years from the time Abraham entered Canaan to the time that the patriarch Jacob entered into Egypt. The period in Egypt is stated in the book of Exodus, that being Exodus 12:40, and also not to mention that the original Hebrew stated, and I quote, that they were in the lands of Egypt and Canaan, for it was 430 years. Now let's look at the prophet Joseph. We know that he was sold into slavery in Egypt, and shortly after he was made the vizier by the pharaoh. I have high reason to believe that Amos I was in fact this pharaoh. When Joseph became the vizier, the pharaoh gave him a wife, that being a seneth, or alternatively known as Tuya, and a signet ring that was in the shape of a scarab beetle. On September 22, 2009, an article appeared in the Egyptian Daily about the discovery of scarab seals that were written in hieroglyphics, once in Joseph's original name, and the other with the name that the pharaoh gave him. With the given information, we can start to put together a better picture of what actually happened to the prophet Joseph. He was born in Canaan during the reign of Pharaoh Tal II in Egypt. He is later sold into slavery during the reign of Amos I. This is when the first of the seven years of plenty began. Then Amenhotep I began his rule, and when Joseph returned to Egypt after burying his father Jacob in the land of Canaan, Pharaoh Amenhotep I dies. Thutmose I becomes the next Pharaoh. Then it is Thutmose II, and then his wife, Hatshepsut, and finally Thutmose III as he does his last four years of co-reign. After the prophet Joseph dies, 
Pharaoh Amenhotep II began his four years of co-reign, and then Thutmose the fourth, and finally the Pharaoh that knew not of Joseph, Amenhotep the third. Now, just keep this in mind, Joseph was 110 years old when he died. So here's a really interesting question for everyone. Who was the baby-killing Pharaoh? Now, as a shocker as this may seem, the baby-killing Pharaoh was none other than Amenhotep III. But wait, how can this be if Moses was saved from the river? Well, this is because he was saved by the Pharaoh's daughter, Hanateneb. She did this in defiance of her father's orders. Now, another really interesting question does come to mind. Where exactly did Moses go? Well, the Bible tells us that he lived in the lion's lair in the Nile Delta with Queen Ty. Now, I also suspect that Moses' family was probably working on the Achman Palace during this time. Just really briefly here, because Moses was adopted by Queen Ty, it would also be logical to say that Moses was in fact the runaway Crown Prince Thutmose. In the Bible, Moses is raised as the Pharaoh's own son, but after he's exiled and the Pharaoh dies, another son, that being Moses' stepbrother, then becomes king. During most of the period in question, the rule of Egypt was actually the Pharaoh Akhenaten. The Pharaoh Akhenaten did indeed have an older brother, that being Prince Thutmose. Prince Thutmose was said to be the next heir to the throne, but for some unrecorded reason, just like Moses, was exiled from Egypt before he could become king. The Bible tells us basically nothing about Moses' time as an Egyptian prince, but the first century Jewish historian Josephus actually records a number of traditions associated with Moses that still survived during his time 2,000 years ago. One of them was that Moses had at one time been a commander of the Pharaoh's chariot forces. An ivory whip bearing Prince Thutmose's name was found in Tutankhamun's tomb. It is inscribed with hieroglyphics revealing that he had, at some point in time, been the king's chariot commander. Josephus also suggests that while he still followed the Egyptian religion, Moses had been a priest in the temple in the city of Heliopolis in northern Egypt. And ironically enough, inscriptions discovered in the ruins of the Temple of the God Ra in Heliopolis do indeed refer to Prince Thutmose having spent time there as a high priest. The order of events goes as follows. Amenhotep IV changes his name to Akhenaten. Then once his reign was done, Smekakari rules briefly. And the pharaoh who was reigning during the time Moses had disappeared was none other than the famous king himself, King Tutankhamun. And not to mention that King Tutankhamun is the king who died under mysterious circumstances. Shortly after King Tutankhamun died, his widow was replaced by the Pharaoh I, also known as King Tutankhamun's vizier. And then once the Pharaoh I's reign was done, the titles passed on to Haremheb, his military commander. And finally, by the time Moses had returned to Egypt, Ramses I was the Pharaoh of Egypt. Now that we know who the pharaohs were during this period, we can therefore start putting together some of the pieces of the puzzle. Like for example, the Bible mentions an oppressive pharaoh, and this could be a reference to Pharaoh Seti I. Okay, so now what about the enslaved Israelites, and where do they fit into this story? Well, you see, they were originally called the Hyksos. The term Israelite wasn't even in use at the time, and we also have references of them building the cities of Ramses and Pithom. We also, as a matter of fact, have a stele which mentions the Israelites in Egypt. The evidence itself shows us that these slaves were actually building supply cities for the cities of Ramses and Pithom. You see, Egypt actually had intimate relations with Canaan and most of the Semitic people who migrated there. So for an example, there was an Egyptian papyrus that was recently discovered not too long ago which, ironically enough, mentions a wealthy Egyptian lord whose 77 slaves included 48 of Semitic origins. Next, I would also like to clarify that there were not actually 3 million Jews who fled from Egypt. First of all, that's almost the whole population of Egypt at the time. Let's use Herodotus for this example. He claimed that 1 million Persians invaded Greece in 480 BC. Yet, we now know that not only did this invasion actually happen, but the number of people who invaded Greece was greatly exaggerated. And because of this line of thinking, some scholars therefore conclude that the biblical word Aleph doesn't necessarily mean thousand. The word Aleph also means group, a clan, a leader, or even a chief. First Kings 2030 
is a really good reference of this. Instead of the verse saying that 20,000 men were killed by the wall, it would make much more sense to say that the wall had killed 20 officers or leaders. In contrast, we can therefore safely say that the amount of Jews whom fled Egypt were probably more like 20,000 people rather than 3 million. And finally, here's the last one that I would like to clarify in regards to the Exodus story. Why were they in the desert for 40 years? Well, after they left Goshen, Egypt, the quickest way to Israel would have steered Moses to the caravan roads that parallels to the Mediterranean coastline. However, because Egyptian guards were guarding this road, God didn't want any fleeing refugees to fight any battles along the way. And this is exactly why Moses traveled south. They then crossed the narrow guild of Suez, or otherwise known as the Sea of Reeds. Now as he arrives at Mount Sinai, he spends 40 days and 40 nights there. Please also keep in mind that he climbed Mount Sinai 8 times before God actually gave him the Ten Commandments. This in turn would mean that Moses spent roughly 4 months just at Mount Sinai alone. And if you add this story of the 12 spies, this gives you an additional 2 months, and this would be 6 months total. The real reason that Moses and the Israelites spent 40 years in the desert was because of the 12 spies. They didn't think it was even possible to take over the land, and as a result, they wandered the desert. Only two men were permitted to enter the promised land once they found the chance to take over the land. They were Joshua and Caleb. Now because of the Israelites' belief of the false report it brought them against the land of Israel, and according to God, this was considered a great sin. Now please keep in mind that this wasn't because they could enter the promised land, this was because of their unwillingness to take the land. It was only the two men, Joshua and Caleb, who didn't slander the land, which is exactly why they were permitted to enter the land. So once again, just as a recap, it's not that they couldn't find the promised land, they were just unwilling to take the promised land, and this is exactly why they spent 40 years in the desert. As a matter of fact, it wasn't until the victory of Jericho that marked the possession of the promised land. And furthermore, I personally believe we have so much evidence of this journey that we even had the city of Petra, the nearby house of the snake tomb, Marawusi, or otherwise known as the Valley of Moses, where the realest spring of Moses can be found, and we even had the tomb of Aaron on Mount Hor near Petra in Jordan. Okay, now that we've got this out of the way, now let's go back to my earlier point why I believe that Ramses I is in fact the Pharaoh of Exodus. I personally believe that Pharaoh Ramses I is in fact the Pharaoh of Exodus based on the Ten Plagues of Egypt. With the award-winning documentary, The Patterns of Evidence, The Exodus, we learn that Egyptian history should really be pushed forward on the timeline by 200 years. And when we do this, we have a really good time frame for the volcanic eruption on the island of Santorini in the south of Greece. Now if this was truly the cause of the plagues, then it would make perfect sense that the plagues were really the fallout of a volcanic eruption. Even the author of the Ten Plagues of Egypt, Archaeology, History, and Science, he looks at the Bible and even argues that ancient Egyptian medical texts support this idea. The winds would have carried the volcanic ash to Egypt, and at some point over the summer, the toxic acids in the volcanic ash would have included the mineral cinnabar, which would have been capable of turning a river a blood-like red color. The accumulated acidity in the water would have caused frogs to leap out and search for clean water. Insects would have burrowed eggs in the bodies of dead animals and human survivors, which in turn would have generated larvae and then adult insects. Then the volcanic ash in the atmosphere would have affected the weather with acid rain landing on people's skin, which in turn would have caused boils. The grass would have been contaminated, poisoning the animals that ate it. The humidity from the rain and the subsequent hail would have created optimal conditions for locusts to thrive in. Why, even this volcanic eruption could also explain the several days of darkness. And this means that 9 out of the 10 plagues of Egypt have been accounted for. Egyptologists also found an ancient Egyptian account of the children of Aristocats lying dead in public and archaeological data matching this account. Some Egyptologists believe that amidst all of this destruction, the firstborn children could have been sacrificed out of desperation in hopes that such a meaningful sacrifice would lead their gods to stop punishing them. Another really interesting theory revolves around red allergy. This theory, which was put forward by many scientists such as John S. Marr, an epidemiologist, who wrote a 1996 journal article featured in the New York Times, has argued that red allergy could have sucked oxygen out of Egypt's waterways, killed the fish, and even turned the water red. And just as in the volcano theory, frogs then leapt out looking for food and died. 
Without frogs to eat the insects, the pest proliferated and feasted on the corpses, a feeding frenzy for both flies and locusts. And yet, we have a paper that even argues that lice could have been a type of insect called colicoides, which could then carry two types of diseases that would explain the livestock deaths, African horse sickness and blue tongue. The boils on humans could have been caused by glanders, an airborne bacterial disease spread by both flies and tainted meat. In this theory, the darkness is coincidentally caused by a sandstorm. The darkness would have left the crops, well, whatever crops were left after all the other problems, that is, moldy, and the mold could have produced airborne toxins that might just explain this very same widespread childhood death. Now this addendum to the algae theory, which points out that for red algae to flourish in the first place, there needs to be slow, sludgy, warm water. And wouldn't you know it, in 2010, research on stalagmites have indeed suggested that there have been indeed a dry period towards the end of the rule of a very specific pharaoh, Pharaoh Ramses II. Now this change would have certainly dried up the Nile and significantly slowed down the flow of water. I would also like to mention that the dates that I have are based on the original Hebrew manuscript rather than the corrupted Masoretic copy. If you look at, say, the Greek Septuagint, for example, the dates are drastically different and this is because the older the text, the more accurate the dates will be. Now, after some really hard research, I found out that the real reason for this incorrect chronology wasn't because of some translation issue or that someone had written down a different date, the real reason was because of the early scribes from the 1st and 2nd century who were trying to disprove that Jesus was the Messiah. Now, I won't discuss this in today's episode, but basically this has to do with a man named Melchizedek and Jesus not being of the Levitical lineage. But going back to the chronology here, as some historians suggest, and moving the timeline forwards, we then start to see that the Exodus, as mentioned in the Bible, is indeed the best explanation of what actually happened during this period. The point is, with a timeline that has been corrected, the timing of the pharaohs, the volcanic eruption, the mysterious death of King Tutankhamun, and even Pharaoh Akhenaten's religion of Atenism, everything that I am seeing points to this time frame between Ramses I and Ramses II. And not to mention that this would make Ramses I, Seti I, and Ramses II the three pharaohs as mentioned in the Bible. Well, alright, so there you have it. This has been the genealogical chart based on the seven generations from Abraham down to Moses. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed today's video. And remember that today's video was me looking at things from a historical point of view. And as usual, if any questions or comments, please let me know below. And until then, ciao everyone.